Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of our series of screencasts on distributed word representations. The focus of this screencast will be on matrix designs. Let's start with the word by word design that we concentrated on in part one. Uh, so here again, we have a vocabulary uh, along the rows. That same vocabulary is repeated along the columns and the cell values capture the number of times that each row word co-occurred with each column word in some large collection of texts. Um, this matrix will have two properties that I think make it noteworthy for developing semantic representations. The first is it will be very dense. And as we bring in more data from ever larger corpora, it will get denser and denser in virtue of the fact that more words will tend to co-occur with more other words in these, this ever larger collection of documents. Um, the second is that it kind of has the nice property that its dimensionality will remain fixed even as we bring in more data. As long as we decide on the vocabulary ahead of time, all we'll be doing is incrementing individual cell values. And so we can bring in as much data as we want without changing the fundamental design of the object. Both of those point, uh, things are points of contrast with another common design that you see in the literature, especially in information retrieval, and that is the word by document design. For this design, again, I have words along the rows, but my columns are now individual documents and the cell values capture the number of times that each word occurs in each one of those documents. As you can imagine, this is a very sparse matrix in contrast to the word by word one that we just looked at in virtue of the fact that most words don't appear in most documents. It will also have the property that as we bring in more data in the form of more documents, the, the shape of the matrix will change. We'll be adding column dimensions for each new document that we bring into the space. Uh, and that could really affect the kind of computations that we can do. The only thing that balances against the ever increasing size of this matrix is that because it is so sparse, we might have some easy and efficient ways of storing it efficiently, putting it on par with a much more compact but dense word by word matrix that I showed you before. Now, those are two very common designs that you see in the literature, but I want you to think creatively and kind of align your matrix design with it whatever problem you're trying to solve. So let me show you one that's really radically different. Um, this is what I've called the word by discourse context matrix. Uh, I derived this from the switchboard dialogue act corpus, which is the switchboard corpus where each dialogue act has been annotated by an expert annotator with the sort of dialogue act or speech act that was performed by that utterance. What that allows us to do is collect uh, a matrix where the rows are again words, but the columns are those individual labels that annotators assigned. I think this is a really interesting matrix. I think if you appear even at this small fragment, you can see some interesting information uh, emerging. So for example, absolutely occurs a lot in acceptance dialogue acts, whereas more hedged words like actually in any way are more common in things like rejecting part of a previous utterance. And I'm sure there are lots of other interesting patterns in this matrix. And of course, that's just a glimpse of the many other design choices that you could make. Again, think creatively. You could have something like adjective by modified noun. This would probably capture some very local syntactic information or collocational information. We could generalize that a bit to word by syntactic context to explicitly try to model how words associate with specific syntactic structures be very different from our usual semantic goals for this course. Word by search query might be a design that you use in information retrieval. We don't even have to limit this to linguistic objects. Word by person could capture the number of times that each person per, um, purchased a specific set of products, and then we could cluster people or products on that basis. We could also mix linguistic and non-linguistic things. So word by person might capture different usage patterns for individual speakers and again, allow us to doing some kind of interesting clustering of words or of people. Uh, we can also break out of two dimensions. We can have something like word by word by pattern or verb by subject by object. Many of the methods that we cover in this unit are easily generalized to more than two dimensions. So you could have that in mind. And of course, as I said, think creatively and think in particular about how your matrix design is aligned with whatever modeling goal you have or whatever hypothesis you're pursuing. Another connection that I want to make is that even though this feels like a kind of modern idea in NLP, vector representations of words are actually, or of objects, are actually pervasive, not only throughout machine learning, but also throughout science, right? So think back to older modes of NLP where we would write a lot of feature functions. We'll be exploring such techniques. They can be quite powerful. 
even though they feel very different from the distributional hypotheses that we've been pursuing, in fact, they also represent individual data points as vectors. So for example, given the text like the movie was horrible, I might reduce that with my feature functions to a vector that looks like this. And I might know as a human that four captures the number of words, zero captures the number of proper names, and one over four captures the percentage of negative words according to some sentiment lexicon. That's a human level understanding of this. In fact, those dimensions will acquire a meaning to the extent that they assemble them into a vector space model and the column wise elements are compared with each other. So even though the origins of the data are very different, in fact, this is just like vector, vector representations of words in the way we've been discussing it. The same thing happens in experimental sciences where you might have an experimental subject come in and perform some act in the lab they do a complicated physical and human thing and you reduce it down to a couple of numbers like a choice they made or a reaction time and a choice and so forth. Um, we might model entire humans or entire, entire organisms with a vector of numbers representing their physical characteristics and perspectives and outlooks and so forth. Again, we might know what these individual column dimensions mean, but they acquire a meaning when we're doing modeling only to the extent that they are embedded in a matrix and can be compared to each other across the columns and so forth. There are many other examples of this where essentially fundamentally all of our representations are vector representations. So maybe the far out idea for this unit is just that we can gather interesting vector representations without all of the hand built work that goes into the examples on the slide right now. A final technical point, a uh, question that you should ask that's kind of separate from your particular uh, matrix design, what is going to count as co-occurrence? So I think there are at least two design choices that are really important when answering this question. To illustrate them, let's use this small example. So I have this text from swerve of shore to bend of bay, comma, brings. And imagine that our focus word at our particular point of analysis is this token of the word to. And these indices here indicate going left and right, the distance by counts from that particular focus word. The first question that you want to decide is what your window of co-occurrence is going to be. So for example, if you set your window to three, then the things that are within three distance of your focus word will co-occur with that word, and everything falling outside of that window will not co-occur with that word according to your analysis. If you make your window really big, it might encompass the entire document. If you make it very small, it might encompass only very local kind of collocational information. So you can bet that that's gonna be meaningful. There's a separate choice that you can make uh, falling under the heading of scaling. I think a default choice for scaling is to just call it flat. So what you're saying there is something is gonna co-occur once with your focus word if it's in the window that you've specified. And that would kind of equally weight all of the things that are in the window. You could also decide to scale them. A common scaling pattern would be one over N where n is the distance by word from your focus word. That would have the effect that things occur that occur close to the word of interest co-occur with it more than things that are at the edges that are near the end of the window. Those choices are gonna have really profound effects on the kinds of representations that you develop. Here are some generalizations I could offer. Larger, flatter windows will capture more semantic information. As the window gets very large to encompass, for example, the entire document, you'll be capturing essentially topical information. In contrast, if you make your window very small and scaled, you'll tend to capture more syntactic or collocational information. Independently of these choices, you could decide how text boundaries are going to be involved. So a text boundary at the level of a sentence or a paragraph or a document or a corpus could be a hard boundary that's independent of your window. Or you could decide that you're going to allow your window to go across different notions of segment that you have. That's really up to you. And again, I think it will have major consequences for downstream tasks involving the representations that you've created. To help you begin exploring this space, the associated code release for this course, the associated notebooks, provide you with four word-by-word -word matrices. And they have a few things that allow you to do comparisons. First, there are two matrices that were developed from the Yelp academic data set, which is a lot of reviews of products and services. And there are two matrices that come from GigaWord, which is Newswire text. So there's fundamentally a real difference in the genre of text involved. 
In addition, for each of those pairs of corpora, for each of those corpora, we have two different designs, window size of five and scaling of one over n, which ought to, by my hypotheses, deliver a lot of kind of collocational or syntactic information. And window size of 20 and scaling of flat, a very large window, lots of things co-occurring with lots of other things, that might be a better basis for semantics. And you have those two points of variation, both for Yelp and for GigaWord. And I'm hoping that that kind of gives you a sense for how these design choices affect the representations that you're able to develop with methods that we're gonna cover in later um, parts of the screencast series.